Hello, Adam Spohn. Oh, Fabian and Adam first. That's good. Um, Fabian, okay, just briefly, even though this is on the record, it's not a secret thing, but Dini and I just had another meeting and the effort that you guys are putting in, we're just basically split. First six months of the year is Adam, second six months of the year is Fabian, and we'll figure out what you feel that will mean. Simple, right? Because you're, you, you're kind of amazing. Aha, uh -huh. are you at your dorm? Uh, no, I'm inside the fellow's office here at the School of Advanced Study. Oh, very good. Um, once um, Dini's back, she had to run away. I restart exactly on the dots. Um, it'll be good if you can introduce yourself again. Re re I think most people have met you in um, the future of text two years ago. So look what I got today. I got paper like that because it follows all about use a pen, use a pen. Here's a more expensive pen, buy the new pen. And yet it feels like you're writing plastic on gloss, which is absolutely crazy. And Danny is here, so we're back. And Peter's almost here. I'm guessing he's having brunch. Let's see. Good morning from an early brunch. We're actually ah. not early brunch. It should have been an earlier brunch to have been on cam, but I have a ton of food in front of me and you don't want to watch me chew. No, absolutely not. Uh, morning, Peter. But I was working on an early draft for a section to go into the high resolution thinking paper and I'll email that draft out to you after the meeting. Right, good. Cool. Um, I'm not sure if Leon is joining us today. I think we are probably full crew. Um, and we have someone new today, so why don't we all do introductions? Can we do 30 second introductions starting with Adam's iPhone? Because, oh, okay, you have things going on in the house. Okay, now we can start with Fabian going by random screen here. Hello, hello. <clears throat> so my name is Fabian. And as you might infer from the mess around me, uh, uh, <laughs> What's that? Fabian? I think he must have been watching Three Body Problem and something just took over Fabian. It's not me, I'm on mute, huh? <laughs> oh, oh, really? Okay, I think... Uh, he's okay, he's we're listening. Back. We're back. I mean, we're back to quiet. Is Mark coming this morning? Hope so. I shall bug him. I thought he was coming. I thought he. I just scream at him. That always works. Samia, how are you doing? I am doing good. Uh, in the process of writing my thesis. So good for you. Yeah. Are you and you're in London right now, right? I am in London right now, the University of London, as a visiting fellow. Yes. Yeah. I can't wait to see who wins the make the. Uh... Uh, the uh, new media writing prize. Well, oh, yes, I'm very excited for, for that. I mean, some fantastic work going on. In fact, we have I have a student mentioning... in our program in, in the uh, student and uh, student shortlist works. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. And also, um, I was taught, I was telling for today this morning about the new media writing prize and uh, the brilliant work that they have been doing. Okay, Fabian. Voila. <laughs> Sorry, I, I was very confused because the, the audio was about introductions too. It's like, oh, somebody else is starting before me, so no problem. And and it didn't make any sense. Okay, well, uh, so I'm a prototypist. I uh, focus on WebXR, so VR and AR on the web, mostly for the European Parliament, but uh, with others before like UNICEF or Mozilla. Uh, and I mostly do it because I need to organize my mind. Uh, and for this, I find that notes and posters and wikis and what this, uh, it's not enough. And I hope, maybe naively, but I'm rather convinced that using space around me to organize knowledge uh, is not going to solve everything, but at least help a little bit. Well. That was short and brief. Perfect. Um, Andrew, you are up. 
All righty. Um, I'm Andrew. Uh, I'm the programmer behind one of the prototypes. Um, and uh, but I'm not the mind behind it. I'm I'm just uh, kind of the hands that implement. But it, it's a it's a really interesting job. Um, I get to be between all of the the group, get to hear all the the discourse, and then uh, do my best to implement whatever suggestion was uh, gathered that week. I'm I'm usually several weeks behind <laughs> the most recent suggestion because it takes longer for me to implement, and it does for them to come up with new ideas but it's it's been quite interesting i'm not going to add to everyone's introduction but i will add to andrew's because andrew is that uh, rare combination of highly skilled coder and humble don't see that very often and um, when you say you're not the mind or the brain behind it that is of course rubbish um, you are really conceptually contributing to it however you do the thing that is also very rare you know how to listen and for that, I will in public again say thank you because it's yeah, it's brilliant. Um, I'll add that he's in my lab. He's he was a former student of mine. He's also going with me to Victoria. He was with me at the Hypertex conference in Rome, and he's going with me to Poland. Yeah, and I met him first in Rome, but I had no idea about any of this stuff. So it's before <laughs> before slow. Uh, Rob, you're next. Uh, I'm Rob. I'm a writer. I'm a fly on the wall in this group. So basically, I'm here to listen. Uh, I did promise I would write something uh, squishy and uh, fantastical about the future of uh, VR headsets. And since I just finished a novel in which I have a character who has one, I've done most of the work already. So I'll have that for you by Monday. Fantastic. Thank you, Rob. I want to add to about about uh, Rob to Samia. Rob is a very famous pioneer of electronic literature. He was on the advisory board of, of directors for ELO in the early earliest iteration. I have documentation of his emails back and forth to Margie Lusenbrink, and uh, he's also been hanging out with us for the past year and a half in my lab, and a good friend. Yes, I uh, know about that, that he was one of the founding members. I'm aware of uh, the scholarship, but the other finer details I did not know. I would... uh, since since you are correctly, as you should, Samia, talking, please introduce yourself and please pronounce your name again, because it's so different from how it's written, and I'm still learning it. And we'll ask he's you. Frozen. I think yeah. he's frozen. There oh, no, go. you're back. Yes, um, I, I'm guessing you didn't hear any of that. Uh, you were frozen for a minute. Um, please introduce yourself. You are next on my screen. Me, right? Yes. Yes. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, there was the, the network is slightly wonky here. Apologies for that. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Shama Roy. I have uh, met some of you uh, in the 2022 future of text um, that happened inside the Linnean Society. And I have very fond memories of that. So I am a PhD scholar at IIT Jodhpur and currently serving as a visiting fellow at the University of London. I am uh, also involved in the digital humanities and the literary studies. I'm a literature student by training. And I'm, I'm supposed to submit my PhD thesis uh, sometime this time next year. So fingers crossed. Now I'm in the writing phase of my thesis where I am realizing that it is me that has to write the thesis, which is sad. So, uh, so yeah, that's, that's about me. I hope to learn from the discussions and everything. I'm curious. Thank you. I, uh, having gotten my PhD on Monday, the only advice I can give you as, when it comes to writing a PhD is don't listen to a word I say. Not a single word. Can you please say your first name one more time? Yeah, my my uh, first name is Shammo. My middle name is Broto. You can say Shammo Broto and uh, Roy. So, so my first name is Shammo. So Shammo yeah. is, okay, because it looks, in writing to me, it looks like Samya, which is how I introduced you to my wife today. So yeah, Shammo. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is the anglicized way of saying it. And this is the Bengali way of saying it. So. Okay, well, we do want it to be the Bengali way. That's for damn sure. Uh, thank you. Um, and then we have, um, well, Dina, you need no introduction. But I you know him. <laughs> he knows me. 
<laughs> yeah, we, we all know you. And uh, Peter, um, get that sandwich out of your face. Okay. Um, I'm an independent scholar and programmer, formerly trained in law. Um, my interests go very much to the technical. I love building complicated systems that have a, a lot of leverage points in them and a lot of articulation points. So I tend to come up with systems that are grounded in parsing expression grammars, parsers, programming language design kinds of concepts. I want all of our tools to be as open-ended and flexible as possible. And I absolutely despise the, there's an app for that one single tool operating in isolation for everything mentality that the app store brought to us. I think it was a huge step backwards in the kinds of systems that we had available. I'm a big Tinderbox user and part of that community too. And outside research interests are straying heavily to international expositions and world's fairs of light, which is a really interesting domain because it's so highly cross-disciplinary and it's almost like the exact mirror image of what we have working with the ACM Hypertext Corpora, where we have total control as publishers over the visual meta. We can have the tooling of the system generated for us, whereas in a multidiscipline area, you don't have control over that. You're working with documents that you don't own, and that's why we need to have detached visual meta so that we can go augmenting documents that, again, we don't have direct an automatic control voice over. message system. Ooh. Who's that? <laughs> Uh, We're having a bad phone day phone. with tech. <laughs> Thanks. Well, thank you, Peter. That was a refreshing and honest way of saying you do complicated stuff, <laughs> which is good and true and worth. Okay, back to my food. <laughs> and, and also, I have to, as I do on basically a weekly basis, I have to credit you with the notion. Sorry, of... the mailbox is full. That's so weird. There shouldn't be anybody with that here. Anyway. Um, I just want to, to highlight to everyone that we talk a lot about metadata in this community and we, because of Peter's contribution, we really separate what we think should be core native. This is what something was born with versus the metadata and post later that must be easy to delete. So Peter, that's just such an important thing. Uh, Mark and then Leon introductions, please. Mark. Oh, it has broadband is messing up again. Are you here, Mark? Okay, Leon, can you introduce yeah. yourself? We have a uh, Sham. Are you still there, Shami? Yeah, he's here. Audio. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Just a brief intro, please. Yeah, hi there. I'm uh, Leon, Leon van Kamen. I am a um, WebXR fiddler, researcher. Um, and I focus mostly on um, art and a spec called XR Fragments, which allows us to reuse um, 3D models and serve them, link them, and navigate them, basically. And I also enjoy, uh, on a weekly basis, to talk with my future of text friends about um new ways of dealing with um basically all things <laughs> all things considered that's an american reference oh well okay this is all very good so we have an agenda today can you believe it uh, just happens to be an agenda like we have every single wednesday if you um i, I can share a screen here as well yeah um mark just uh, texted it with his gone right if you can't see this, uh, wave about. Um, so this is particularly an issue for um, for Adam, the first one. Uh, we may need to think about a potential design day for more European friendly time because with three kids and lots of things going on, it's very difficult to for Adam to reliably be here on um, basically dinner time. It's um, his time at six to seven. So if there are, for the Europeans there, if there's any other time that suit you as well, uh, we can look at that. Um, now, this, that bumps up against a big thing that we haven't talked about, and that is, I believe Fabian is coming on board more in, in you know, direct work over the next few months. 
I'm hoping Fabian will nod now in this little video. Yeah, yeah, good. So Adam will be building a parallel thing to Andrew that will work on the same data, include the same layouts. And we haven't really talked, Fabian, sorry to kind of put you on the spot, but we need to talk about how you feel your work should fit in, in that sense. So that's why I'm saying if, if we have a time for that, uh, we really want to make it possible for the American half of this to be there. And we'll just have to look at realities and we're still recording everything. I don't know what else to say. Any other comments on that? A potential design? Well, right, now, right now it's uh, eight o'clock my time and it's dinner time in England. Is that correct? Here it is uh, 4.15 in Sweden and Europe it is 5.15. Yeah. So if you want to, is it better for you to to work later in the evening when the kids are in bed, Adam? I mean, I don't have to meet at eight in the morning, I promise. <laughs> I'm not an eight in the morning kind of girl. Um, yeah, sometimes it is, but it's also kind of, kind of putting them to bed and it's hard to sneak out and there is... With one kid, it's po perhaps possible. With three kids, the, the probability that all of them <laughs> are going to bed pr properly is low. <laughs> the math. Uh, so, a day a regular daytime uh, is best for me. So, perhaps even early morning for me could work, and it's late for you. But uh, yeah, we, but you, it's, why don't you guys work it out and just let this just let's not do this now because we don't have time to haggle over time but just give some t give some times this works for all of you and just pass it on to Frodo and me huh yeah the, the poll um that you had uh, adam for our meeting here in london maybe we can add some uh, things on there right so uh, so that's actually the next thing just a quick reminder may 31st or 3rd of june flexibly um i'm so excited uh, people are coming to that uh, update on the invitations. I have sent a few. I'm taking my time because this is the sort of thing I screw up with great aplomb. Um, thankfully, I copy them into Dini, so that's with two people. Um, so that's happening. Are there any other announcements? Can I talk about the invitations I've sent out? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, as you know, I'm inviting local people. These are folks that will not be participating in the book, but they are movers and shakers in the the Portland, Vancouver, and Seattle areas. So Ben Camarado, from, he's head of franchise development at Wizards of the Coast. Wizards makes a lot of games. Um, he's very involved in VR. He was on the, he was a senior designer on the Halo project for many, many, many years. And then he took this job with Wizards before the pandemic because Wizards wanted to get into, into VR. And so he took the position. He's coming. I also have Max Alt um, and his crew, with somebody from his crew coming from LSW Architects, which are into using VR for architectural structures and design, which I think is really useful. Um, people from the Murdoch Charitable Trust who are giving us the space for free. We have one person, the CEO from that organization coming. She's in control of $2 billion worth of um, assets. And so we really want her to come. Ron Arp, who is in charge of Identity Clark County, which is our big policy organization here in the Vancouver area, handling everything from, you know, bridge construction to um, traffic you know, patterns and that kind of stuff. They're interested in VR from the standpoint of using it for visualization. So he's very interested. Skip Newberry is the CEO and president of the, the, the Technology Association of Oregon huge organization that handles anything tech oriented and they're trying very hard to revamp the, the creative technologies in Oregon right now so he's very interested and Toby Roberts president COO of Happy Finish a VR game uh, VR game uh, interactive media company he's from England he has an office in England in London and um, in here in the Vancouver area that he's coming I'm still waiting to hear from a few other folks, but it looks like right now we've got a nice turnout of people coming from the local community, which is great. Yeah, that, that's phenomenal. It's just really wonderful. You know, the, the only criteria for someone to be here is that they passionately care or that we can help bridge the gap for them to get into this. Yes, that's perfect. 
And well, can I mention one more thing? The thing about the Sloan Foundation grant is that we have to expand our, you know, expand our our body, our people, and this expands it exponentially. And they also want it in the United States, the symposium, because they wanted to start to bring in people from the U.S. and and kind of get them interested in this project. Uh, and we also have a student a student competition, and a lot of these people um, that are involved and in, that are coming from this group could be very easily people that could help fund that project, that piece of the project. So, Yeah, uh, thanks for that level of stress there. We do need to focus more on that now. Yeah, you are absolutely right, Dini. Um, right, so papers, um, I'll just read them to see if there's an agreement or not. Uh, there is a demo paper, I'm sure we'll think of something better as a title, but that's basically explaining what this is. Dini has essentially written it. Uh, I'll work with her, Andrew and Mark also. Then there is the thing that I'm headlining, let's call it that, the high resolution thinking in journals, uh, which will have more contributions. I know Peter's already written for it, which is great. I have tried to send it to you a few times, but it gets a bit crazy, so it's taken a while. Uh, please, everyone feel extremely welcome to add to that. Then there is citation views, also not final title by Mark and Adam, and the inner hypertext of digitally native documents by Mark. That probably has the final title. Um, and so for the rest of the day today, um, the... can, I, can I ask a question? Uh, this is something that, that we've been talking, we talked about you and I earlier today about the papers. The high resolution paper, we're recommending that it's the, the extended abstract, which is two pages. That way, there's not any stress. We don't, we have a better chance next year of writing the long paper. I would love to be able to see a long paper come out of this team that we can maybe win a competition with, but the two pager would be so nice to do. We can, it's chewable, we can do it. And we don't, we don't have to overpromise anything. And this, the ACM people are a tough crowd. I've reviewed papers for them I'm reviewing right now. They do not, they're not kind. <laughs> they don't, they're not flexible about what gets in and what gets what not in. So I don't want to do anything that's going to get us not accepted. And so overpromising would do that. Does that make sense to everybody? We're at the beginning of our project, so we don't have to promise them a whole hell of a yeah. lot. Yeah, uh, as a peer reviewer for hype, hype ticks, I can concur that um, yeah, it's 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 fairly bulbed, the the um, the judging. So okay. I've worked with Mark Bernstein. I have to say this: Mark and I were on the same paper, and it, he it, he's fussy even to other reviewers. So reviewers get into tussles over papers. Like oh, that's not acceptable. Why'd you say this? You know this? Did you even read that paper? <laughs> So we don't want that kind of response to our paper. <laughs> Dini, have you seen the movie American Fiction? Oh, I love that. Oh, God. I read yeah. the book. The book is even better. <laughs> I watched it on the flight while coming here. I loved it. Yeah. I loved it. The, the book is so good. So uh, on that, uh, Dini, th this is what I've written so far. And I, you're the boss of academic because you're the one with the knowledge. So I'm perfectly happy to... Um, shrink this down make it a two-page thing as you say and then um some of this obviously is going to go in our own book the future of text so that's another mm -hmm. issue and then we'll look at next year so yeah we'll, we'll do that right uh, yeah so after i've done blabbering on here uh, there's no programming by andrew today which is absolutely fine so fabian is going to do a demo right fabian yeah sure and then after that, we're going to talk about what we're actually building now in a greater level of detail. And then we'll just finish off with, with the next steps. So over to um, Belgium. <clears throat> so I'll try to share my screen again. Uh... Well, Fabian is trying to share the screen. I just want to remind you to every once in a while, not necessarily after every meeting, every once in a while, look at the PDF in Slack record of our meetings to see if something offends you because it was wrong. Generally, I think it's actually quite good, but it most certainly is not perfect. I've had to edit things myself. So... 
So let me know if you can see my screen, please. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I don't really remember why I started this, uh, but I remember um, uh, wanting to have basically a menu and that the menu, because I do inside that environment, I can teleport around. If you can see the top right corner, I can go there and I need to be able to have some of the code there or the buttons, the interactions. Um, so one of is always on my wrist, like a shortcut basically that I can drag there, uh, but it's not enough. Uh, and some of the code is floating there I can use, but sometimes I want a more traditional menu. So I started to reproduce uh, one that I've seen. Uh, I'll put the link on, on GitHub. I think Igor made this. Um, and basically here, when I pinch in space and there is nothing around, like no code or no, nothing to grab and move around, it makes a little, a small cube appear and the opacity changes with how long it's been. So basically, if I click and I let go, it's going to appear and disappear right away. But if I hold it for about half a second, then it's going to uh, make it appear. Uh, so at that point, it was not usable yet. Uh, this is the same, but with inter uh, proximity. So if I get close to that cube, you can see the wireframe and then away from wireframe. And then if I'm close enough, as you saw with the uh, green part, uh, then I do something. It's like the button has been pressed if you want. So nothing, nothing. And if I'm close enough, no, still nothing. <laughs> Well, if I'm close enough, it changed the color of the button. Um, and uh, nearly finally, I do it again. But then instead of having one button, I can have a, another button. So a sub menu. Um, and then you can go like recursively and have a sub menu of a sub menu. Uh, and it, it's relative to me. So when I do the first pinch, but it's also spatial, like I can still uh, click on it. And then extending it to a lot more uh, buttons with a couple of colors. Um, so when I release, when I go on the button, uh, it's going to show uh, that it's selected, like it becomes full, not wireframe. And when I release, uh, if I release on the button, it's going to apply that action, which is here, just as an example, it's changing color. And lastly, uh, just before this meeting, I just wanted to see how many of those I could realistically fit. So I took 140 colors, the CSS colors, and I just stack them up. Uh, it's too close, so it works kind of, but not properly. Uh, so you see, I, I press blue here and I get the wrong shade. So I think when you release, basically, <clears throat> the finger moves ever so slightly. And here at one cent cubic centimeter precision, uh, it's pro it doesn't look like it's good enough. And in terms of performance, having 140 buttons that change color and opacity again and again and, and tracking, it's a little bit borderline. It's usable. There are, you can you can feel the lag, basically. Uh, but with about 50 buttons, um, it, it's, uh, it felt pretty good, like pretty responsive. Voilà. So I have a question, Fabienne. So that's interesting. I'm interested in the um, how how much space is required for interactivity. So you've got 50 buttons at work and that you're saying it's a, the boxes are a centimeter, how large is each box, a centimeter square? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, it, so the proximity, you can put two of those side by side and touch those as long as it's one centimeter square so shape. I, yes, actually touching them uh, works uh, even with one centimeter and they're literally uh, next to each other. So that mm -hmm. works. The problem I have right now is like when I, I'll put a bit closer to the camera, when I let go, uh, the position of the pinch when it's released, I think it's one of the two fingers. And basically if it's a centimeter, then I pinch outside of the box or away from it. So, mm -hmm. but if I, if I just hold my finger like this, uh, I can go, I mean, tracking for now works um, sub-centimeter, I would say. Uh, 
Uh, and it, it's really reliable. Like if you see the highlight for the color, it is like in the middle of the pinch is the right cube being selected. So for, sorry, it's, if it's not clear, uh, going through pinching like this, centimeter is good and letting go for now, I don't know how to do this. So if I let, if the action is done when I release the pinch, then I space them out by about three centimeters. And then if I do this, then it's going to always, or I guess 99% uh, select the right one. I'm asking because the Apple Watch is an interesting model, right? Because when you're trying to log in, the the, the little squares where you're touching your fingers to, to, to log in are tiny, right? My watch has a crack in it now. So I'm finding that I have to be very, very, in the old days, I could just very quickly hit on those hit on those squares and I can turn on my watch. Now I have to be very particular about where my finger is. And um, so there seems to be something going on with the with the scrap with the uh, crack. But this is a very small size, right? That's a tiny, tiny size. So it looks like we're able to get pretty close to what the Apple Watch is um, allowing for. So I, I did not um, I did not go lower and maybe it's I mean it's definitely possible. Uh, one thing that would be probably interesting in terms of accessibility uh, is to make this a parameter, namely the size of the cube and the spacing of the cube. I mean I just use cubes because I like cubes, but easier yeah. for me. Uh, but but that could be a parameter. So for example, somebody who doesn't have like kids, for example, young kids, they don't have the dexterity yet. So you don't want some fine, precise motor control as a requirement. Uh, and maybe, I don't know, you're in the plane and it's shaking. So I think having this as something flexible, uh, but overall my, I mean, I'm, it's, it's a bet of course, but I'm rather confident that uh, between, for example, this uh, or uh, that the curve of uh, progression, as long as, again, we are hooked on quality cameras uh, as cameras will improve, tracking, uh, hand tracking, and any kind of tracking will improve. And I guess we'll go, I don't know, maybe sub millimeter. I have no idea. Well, one yeah. more question I think we might be thought to think about is that maybe it's not squares because squares fit so close together. Maybe it's triangles or circles because your, your hand, your finger would have more space. It would not be as close. It wouldn't be butted up against it as tightly, right? If you put circle side by side, you have more space for your fingers to be a little sloppier. Yes, yes, indeed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what the ideal shape is. It is it. Um, yeah, I guess it, it depends really. Here, um, the goal was having interactions that is like always relative to you. Again, you can move around the space freely, either teleporting or moving around. And then the menu is always nearby. Like wherever you pinch, as long as the camera tracks it, then the menu is going to open and then sub menu and whatever. Um, but yeah, what the shape is going to be, or even I think Frode, you shared earlier today an example of a menu that looks like the things in a game that you need. Like I think it was um, a backpack with items in it. So that that would still be the same kind of interaction, like you pinch or you activate it somehow um, and then you pick one of the things and you can reorganize because here the how do you say the layout of the button of such a menu is determined like just pretty much to test it to make it work the simplest way uh, but you could reorganize the button yourself so for example to go back to uh, your question uh, Dini, about how or the balance between how close to each other there might be, um, then you could say, okay, I want actually the color, for example, doesn't make sense. I want to rearrange those buttons myself. Mm -hmm. And then I, you store the layout that the user has designed for the buttons. Trying to find that tweet. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, this is very impressive, obviously. Um, I have questions, but they're more unrelated to the next section. So anyone else have questions or comments uh, before that? Yep, <clears throat> I have. Uh, so uh, Fabian, I'm uh, struggling with the same problem uh, as I'm displaying Mark's full data set with 11 
hundred papers or small thumbnail images. And I've been trying to have it as a kind of, not, not a dashboard, but uh, some sort of control panel where you have them at reach all the papers as small, small thumbnails. You press one and get the, as an alternative to the laser pointer up on the wall far away. Um, um, and I think the pinching problem is something we have to solve together, uh, both for the laser pointers. Uh, there is this idea that you, whenever you aim at something for, let's say, a third of a second, that that one, that item is selected in the background invisibly. And whenever you pinch, wherever you are, you trigger the the, the item you had in mind a third of a second ago. It's a kind of a delay, and I think that would work quite well. It will give. Um, it would work against that kind of that pinching. Is not that. Um, it's it's not a well defined thing. When you pinch, you always move your fingers a bit. Um, so I think we could work around that a bit by having that kind of a pre selection, something that always knows that what you're pointing at uh, a third a second ago. Yeah, no, it's, it's something to experiment. Yeah, it, it's um, it, it's kind of frustrating. The, uh, maybe also studying a bit how it's being implemented in uh, in whatever device we choose to use. Um, but yes, some kind of either delay or threshold. Um, because again, the, the selection before doing the action somehow is close to perfect. Or it's exactly what is expected. But the release of the pinch, maybe it's... I'm not sure. Um... And I, I think it has gone worse in the Quest 2. It felt a bit better because it's what's kind of calculated, interpolated. Now when they have higher resolution and actually track fingers better, these po problems pop up because it tracks it too good. So it doesn't understand what, what you intend to anymore, but just what your yeah. fingers are doing. It's uh, indeed. And, and when I did the very first step, the, the cubes were 10 centimeters uh, side and of course there was no problem and they were super far away but then I thought okay that's that works so that it was a good step but it's probably I mean except if you want to do exercise it's probably not the kind of interface you want so I started to go lower and lower um, again it's kind of I guess a bet like do we want to invest time on having uh, the smallest most precise menu and thus find this kind of maybe hardware or OS limitations, or do we say a bit, like I said earlier, we know or we're very confident it's going to improve. It's not our problem to solve. The hardware and the OS uh, are going to solve it for us. So we just say, okay, three centimeters sphere a radius now, uh, or even less actually, uh, and good enough for our use case uh, or if we really need, because we have a hundred papers to show, we dig into it. It's kind of a strategy question. Is it, is it a worthwhile uh, problem to solve, not just for the beauty of the technical challenge, but because we can uncover new usages? And I'm not sure to be. I think so. I mean, I think we don't want to tie ourselves down to one way to interact with the uh, environment. And the way we're going to write up the contract for you is that you're you're not creating necessarily a parallel environment, but you're expanding on what we're doing and taking it in different directions to kind of prod what's possible. I mean, that's what we're supposed to be doing, right? Looking at what's possible in an open source environment using XR. So that sounds perfect. The more of us doing this, is the better, right? It doesn't matter if there's 10 of us going in different directions. As long as we're using the same kind of yeah. source files and open source mentality, I think. So on that point specifically, uh, as I tend to do, <clears throat> I posted like a little video, but I, there is a link to the <laughs> story on the, how I've done it, basically, which I think is relatively straightforward. Um, so it's, it's, all, it's open source already, basically, for this kind of implementation. Um, so couple of things. First of all is hearing this level of discussion is ridiculously wonderful. You know, for the, I wish Brandel was here. 
because for so many years we talked about things and XR, and, and this is such a bizarre reality. Who would have thought that that interaction issue would happen, that literally would kind of stick to your finger, so to speak? It makes sense. It's an interesting issue. It's just so absolutely wonderful to be tackling these issues. So I wanted to say thank you for that. Um, and also, um, no, I, I'll, I'll hold my fire until the next bit and bring that up to you then, Fabian. Please go ahead. So uh, please let me know if you can see my screen. Not yet. Not yet. It says okay. you started sharing, but it isn't actually. <laughs> I think it's literally once per, per session for me. I can't share it twice. So I'll, I'll put the, that's fine. I'll put the link in the chat, but then please do, do open it. Um, I was going to, by sharing my screen, forcing you to do it. So it's um, Oleg uh, Frollo. And uh, I was wrong with uh, about Igor before. And the circular menu is kind of what I was going for. So I'm not there yet. Uh, it's like literally yesterday evening that I started to tinker with this. But I think he has a lot of really good ideas. Uh, and initially, I thought some of those ideas are, uh, let's say, tricky to reproduce in WebXR without like a UI, UX framework. And now I'm thinking with some of the architecture or, or helpers I have, it, it became again like maybe a couple of dozens of lines of code, like 50 or so. Uh, so relatively compact and I want to say easy. Um, so yeah, I think he has a bunch of ideas that are, uh, they're really, they were not just concept in the sense that he did implement them. Uh, and I, I want to dig a little bit deeper. Um, and now, yeah, that the basis is on to go a bit on how should it tilt relative to the kind of gesture? I think it's um, it's um, it it should be a little bit easier now that this piece in my. But I, I recommend you to check his work if you didn't do it yet. I think it's uh, I think original we, ideas. I think we need to, I think we need to invite him to the symposium and book. This page looks really good. Yes. So. Thank you. Um, anything else? We're not dropping your demo, but I think it would be useful to move on to the next stage and integrate. So that one last thing, uh, I did. So I did share the source code, and I did share um, Oleg's uh, URL directly in the source code, so that I don't like, want people to think that some of the ideas implemented are mine when they're not. And I think overall, the provenance aspect is fundamental doing open source and otherwise so i wanted to uh make this very clear uh that being said i i want to i'm rather happy with the result but it's again it's a, a stepping stone for more exploration it's like again going on a hike and then you're on top of one hill and then you see a dozen of hills behind or in front of you rather and then you're excited because you know that behind those there might be even more hills so i think that that's the kind of excitement of open source and provenance and being able to explore. Do you know this guy, Oleg? No, uh, but I I, can't, I had a chat with him once or twice. Not, uh, I don't okay. know him very well, but I am happy to try to uh, propose to him to uh, come uh, do a demo or an event or whatever you think is better. Please do introduce him to us, absolutely. Isn't Actually, he will... in London? Road? Mm. It's in your neighborhood. Uh, that's what I was to throw out. So thank you. Um, maybe we should ask to see him for lunch on the Friday when you guys are here or something. That would be perfect. And I think what I will do is send him this video as soon as it's published, because then he can see directly how much we appreciate his work and how hopefully the discussion together would be fruitful. So you're saying we have to be coherent for the rest of the recording? But... Okay. I mean, he's not going to, he's probably going to uh, give up on us in a couple of minutes after watching this very part. So, no, no, <laughs> just, just for now. Yes. Right. Okay. Uh, let's move on while keeping this firmly in mind. And um, the first bit should be obvious. It's for clarification. And that is um, how I see our ultimate demo. Again, I think we've already agreed on this. 
a, and this is probably a bit longer than we want each person at ACM Hypertext to do, but for the sake of clarity, I'll do the whole thing. Someone sits down on a computer, traditional computer, and does some work. In the beginning, it will be probably our reader because we can control it. We own it. Can I ask a favor? Can I ask a favor? Can you record this piece of the of our um, presentation of our meeting today so I can have this for the demo paper? Well, I'm recording everything, and um, I can try to extract it. But actually, editing the Zoom files is a real pain because they balloon if, if okay. we do any edit. It's so odd. Okay. Okay. Never mind. No, but hang on, Dini, what we will do, we're now uh, 45 minutes in, so let me do this. Claude, uh, this point of the recording is really important. Can you please highlight this when you do the transcript analysis for us? See if that works. Okay, good, thank you. Either way, it's 45 minutes in. Right. This is how I see it for clarification. Someone sits down on any third-party software, starting with our reader. They do things, it's all very fun. And then they decide that in the library view, um, they have a map. They go into a map thing and they have concepts, documents, all of that good stuff. It's not enough on their computer. So they put their headset on and they go to the same software that also has a native vision OS component, such as Reader, which is our experimental thing. In there, they get a huge screen, just a normal flat screen, just massive. They do some work and that's great fun. But then at some point they click a button or do some interaction and then it opens up in Andrew's world. And it's really key, excuse me, that it's the same data and the same layouts. So the uh, JSON that uh, Andrew has so far, we need to work to make sure it works spatially in both directions. That's really important. They go into Andrew's world and Andrew's world is a cylinder. It is a gray background. It is a calm, peaceful, 360 degree swivel chair environment where the user can interact with everything. Now, how they interact, if it's gonna be laser pointer or finger, I don't know, we'll have to experiment. My personal preference is that it's close enough you can reach because being able to touch it to me just works a lot better with the experiences I've had than having the, the, the kind of a gun thing. Um, and one thing we discussed a bit on Monday is that maybe, and again, this part of it is purely for testing. We, you know, we, we use our main hand for touching and interacting. We have the other hand, maybe we do something like do a fist. And as we move it, we shrink and expand the whole cylinder. So it can be far away for a view. And then we do this and it comes close to us, very much like what Brandel did with Bob Horn's mural. That's for discussion later today, that, that kind of thing. Now, here's the other key thing. We currently have the idea of a control panel in Andrew World. Maybe because we've been talking about it, we put the controls on the non-main arm so that the user can touch something there. And then the same data, the same view opens up in what Adam is building. So Adam will be building a completely different interaction, more experimental. But to repeat, same data, same layout has to be stored, plus other things. And then uh, one of the things to discuss today is having yet another way to tap on this arm thing to take inspiration for Fabienne's uh, block, go into Fabienne world. And one thing that I'm thinking now initially as the as, as me, is that what I think the differences will be is the stuff that I've been working on at Author is very 2D and it's fine. Still are lots of things to discuss. What um, Andrew is working on is very much more dimensional, but what Fabian is doing is much more computationally interactive. So I just thought of a marketing term to call it that, smart, smart mapping nodes. So all the little things that are in Adam world, Andrew world, fraud world, when they are in Fabian world, can have more computational muscle. So we can start experimenting with whatever the heck Fabian wants. But inside, let's say each, okay, this is very important to remind ourselves, our default knowledge workspace is a journal slash proceedings. The one we'll be using for hypertext will be the actual hypertext proceedings. That's been decided. 
So that means that we have a limited set of knowledge. It's not going to be all the knowledge in the world, right? So that means that the least we're going to have the paper title, author names, and then we can discuss what to extract in terms of keywords, names, and all of those things. That is very much for our discussion. But having that metadata in each node and having each person being represented as well should mean amazing things in Fabian world. I haven't really thought of that directly yet, but if we have this control on the arm where you go between these three worlds and the same data with different kind of interactions, holy moly, how amazing can that be over? I wrote in here a photo that I'm imagining that the way we can frame this for Sloan is that since we're building for academics, it's a very general term. We didn't say scientist, humanities people, but each one of these types of academic fields requires different environments. I'm imagining that humanities people are going to want what I want, which is that clean slate environment, right? But someone else in computational areas may want the more computational environment. So I think this is a really good way to um, not just offer Sloan one, one way of doing this, but multiple ways. So I fully agree with you, Dini. And I would like to add to that. That is, um, with all loving respect, we don't know what we want. We know the beginning. And, and that's really good. But I can imagine uh, that if we do this right, that you will also very much work in Fabian world, because you know, one of the discussions we had in the group a couple of weeks ago was that you should be able to embed, let's say, an entire LLM as one node. We have an example of um, a colleague of uh, Mark and I, Paul Smart, who was a philosopher who has been building LLMs of famous philosophers. So a, in theory, at least, we could have one of these boxes be representing a point of view or a person or a process or whatever it might be. So that it is not necessarily Fabian level coding, which is way beyond me also, but also you bring in these really, really clever Lego blocks. And when you go through your humanities work or whatever it might be, uh, it, it's like having supercomputers moving around in the space and helping you organize it. I don't know what it means, but I'm so excited that we can experiment. Well, I think also I just wrote in here that twine is something that we teach in our program. It's, you know, very, fame, very, very, very um, easy thing to teach to students. At the same time, it has many different um, environments, sugar cube, you know, all these different things. And some of these lend themselves well for game development, some just for mapping. And so when you are thinking about making a twine project, you look at the different types of twine environments and you pick the one that fits your affordances and, and the constraints. And that's what we're talking, I think what we're talking about here. So it makes yeah. sense. I'm saying, <laughs> I'm saying it makes sense. There's so, already a pattern for this. So yeah, no, but perfect. I, I see here, um, uh, Mark was talking about what proceedings. Uh, I think I should check with Wayne Graves um, if we can have uh, HTML versions of this year's. I'm, I don't know how realistic that is, uh, well, but as I'm actually the, uh, <laughs> on, the, on the committee for that, I can probably give you a reasonable answer. Um, I, the, re the reality is you won't have them until fairly late in the day. Uh, I think it's perhaps over-promising. So my, my, my sense on this is you do it twice. You build one that you know works. If we get stuff late and we've learned enough from the first process that we can just shim in a different data set, that'll be fine. But I would almost guarantee that if we if we went straight for the second, um, we'd, fall, we'd fall at some unseen hurdle. Um, and the good thing is anyway, if we, if we, if we do one for the only, the only um, proceedings in the corpus that we have that has HTML, which is 2022, at least we know we can use that and we're gonna get useful insights from it. I, there's a lot of heads nodding with you. Yeah, sorry about the noises off. I don't know what they're doing outside. I'm just replying to Peter here. So, Mark, uh, what happened to 2023? Um, is there no uh, HTML for that? Um, so, was 22 just a kind of 
test balloon thing or um, it's uh, the other way the around trials? so basically around 2022 21 22 um uh, conferences and journals that submitted their information via the so-called TAP system. It's just an acronym. I can't remember what it stands for in ACM. It, it now spits out HTML, or it did, but they didn't republicize really that. Um, and last year, uh, for, well, because reasons, the committee uh, didn't use TAPs. Uh, so the papers were made a different way, which meant that the, the, the sort of free ride along of the HTML didn't occur, which is a pain in the backside because I have looked at putting my, uh, my paper into HTML, but doing, doing links for 200, 205 references is a bit much just at the moment. Um, but anyway, that, that's the explanation. So in fact, to a degree, I would expect HTML, the, the, the opportunity of HTML as well to be uh, a default going forwards. So it'll be more of those, you know, people who use a, a, a different a different method. Um, the problem being, especially with the committees, they're all ad hoc every year, all volunteers. And there's an element of, de of information that passes along, but um, all sorts of so, things. <clears throat> so follow up on that. Uh, as I understand it right now, HTML publishing is kind of not the standard. Well, it's a HTML, but there is no semantic standard more than getting a few bowls and links and so on. And all the other things like the abstract reference are not like coherently marked even within ACM or uh, and uh, certainly not between publishers. Is that I, correct? I don't believe so. I mean, I'm absolutely sure if you dig around, there will be any number of people who've had a nibble at it themselves. Is there a, so, a standard? So basically no. we have a, a thousands of standards here to work with uh, if we're more kind yeah. of, so we have, just as papers can have a specific format, but in the typography, it does not have a specific. Well, we have the this, dig digital well, equivalent of that right now. So, if I may quickly, uh, Fred, this is yep. the this is basically the provocation of the, the other paper I'm writing, which is we just don't have the tools to make it this. I.e., that, that you can't, as the author, deliberately construct easily within your writing space that that extra skein of metadata. So the useful thing we have with HTML at the moment is, as we found with our experiments in HR, it's it makes it easier to get the text in and out and get the sort of semantic spine of it in terms of paragraphs and things. What it doesn't do, because we haven't put it in there, and there isn't yet a standard for a, a standard set of, of sort of markers for that, is marking up in a sense the inner hypertext for want of a better word of the document so as you say the abstract so the definable things but the one of the one of the examples we've given is that you might have part of the text that relates to figure one and table one so for instance you might want to be able to mark those as well an object that within our malleable xr space that we could we could sort of take that out and do something with it but as far as i'm aware there certainly isn't a standard for this i would be amazed if there aren't um uh, things around whether they're being done as as papers or more likely just individual um, experiments on people's blogs. Thank you, Fred. So in my discussions with um, Wayne, who is in charge of ACM publishing, the technical side of it, the weird thing is they have all of this in an XML database. So all, all of this is there. Uh, the question is how to export it. And because they are being nice to us for several reasons, um, I don't think it's unreasonable for us to say, first of all, give us last year's in the format that you guys want. There's nothing wrong with asking that, that they should be able to do that for us. Um, I, are you absolutely sure? Because their the, the public statement is that it's only papers generated through TAPS that have uh, HTML available or, or essentially in a form that they can easily run out. They will have the information. And the other point being that I don't think TAPS at the moment is generating the sort of extra metadata I've just discovered. What they do have is they will have each paragraph as a paragraph in XML, that kind of thing. So structurally, they have the parts of it. Um, but I don't, I, I, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think they are adding metadata in that the authors aren't, aren't providing. Yeah, okay. So one thing we're confusing ourselves a little bit about here is what data we're talking about, because we're not primarily now talking about augmenting the reading of a specific document. Of course, a document should be available in our system to be read, looking roughly like a PDF at the minimum, uh, you know, ju just to kind of keep keep with the program. But we are primarily talking about 
interacting with the titles and the basic metadata for documents. So, you know, if you, um, this is also very much for discussion, but the way I see it is you have a, the title of a document that often names all of these things on this huge map around you. You should also at least have the abstracts and some keywords and stuff. So you can do powerful views to see how these things relate so you can decide what to read. Um, once you can get inside the document, yes, I would also like to have paragraph level, not only addressability, but also viewability, you know, focus on this paragraph and stuff. Absolutely no question. I don't know what they have available for us. I will write a quick email now and ask, but at least we will be able to have the, um, the top level stuff. I mean, like last year's, I've already done that. It took me a while, it took me two days, but we do have the, the abstracts and blah, 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 basics. Well, I had I had all that done at the conference last year in my Tinderbox document. Yeah, so I, yeah, yeah, you have that as well. So I I could have run that out for you then at the conference. Yeah, but I did AI stuff that you would wince at. No, that's fine. What I mean is, but the source data, the stuff you would sorry, I, this wasn't a competitive comment. What I meant was, but I mean, and I will endeavour to do the same for um, the current the current uh, conference. This year, because, for instance, probably for the stuff that I was working on, there's a more realistic chance that we might be able to include, um, you know, the, the the current stuff in. Um, right. So, so let's just say that Mark and I, in dialogue, we are in charge of getting everyone the best possible data for this, because this is a discussion that comes up often. So, Mark, we will do what we can to to get it to them. Right. Yeah. So then, the, the next thing that has to be designed by the community is the format of how this should be shared amongst the different environments. But we already have the beginning, Andrew has done that. But we need things like X, Y coordinates and all of that stuff. Um, so what probably will be best is if Andrew does what he thinks is best while talking to Fabienne and Adam in case they have some input and then we just test it. Or what do you guys think? Yes, Andrew, I would love to hear from you. I was trying to find the React button, but with the new okay. Zoom layout somewhere. Um, I believe in the layout I made, I have a, a section called custom or, or something along the lines. I forget exactly the word I used, um, but it's it's clearly set up for um, basically just custom data that doesn't fit into the, the classic tagging document information. Um, and that is where I plan to put the coordinate system. Um, it makes the most sense to me, but we can, of course, put it anywhere because it's JSON. Um, that was just the layout yeah. I made. Of course, I know Fabian's yeah. using a different layout. No, that, that's good. But already some issues that we need to address have come up. Uh, one of them is um, while having coffee with Christopher Gutteridge, who was related to our project last week, um, he ran this little thing that compressed the titles of the papers uh, so that they're more readable. Some of them are very, very long. So to have a computational way to make them shorter is useful. And the reason I'm mentioning this now is it also relates to what do we mean by coordinates? When in author, we try to change the map size, the text, just making it bigger or smaller, became a bit problematic because we had to decide where we're scaling it from, which in this case means where we are um, what the center of, of the object is and what the object is. So I, I really look forward to the experiment with you guys just figuring that out because it, it's 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 a bit tricky, I think. I have a feeling Adam has thoughts on this. Yeah, for the moment, I think we should just do <laughs> do whatever. Um, the, the We need to get, get more understanding on what the data we want to support in order to build the format. It's extremely, extremely hard to do a proper data format beforehand. It's kind of emergent and usually it gets best when you have a couple of two or three systems that you need to kind of find a standard from within or else will you just copy the internals of a specific application. That's fine for our case right now. 
uh, as I understand it, we're working with custom data. The data set is kind of highly bespoke. We can't just take any, not even any ACM data, but, but it's very much a very highly bespoke system. And the uh, also author is highly, uh, highly specific author reader. It's a highly specific Mac system with kind of uh, history uh, to it as well, where you build up data. So at this point, I don't think we can sit down and design so much beforehand. We need to actually just get the data down there. And then in a future reiter iteration, we could perhaps do it more uh, more refined and better looking. Uh, but I think it's very hard right now. Can I say something? I actually like the idea of trying different, having different interactive environments and not putting a lot of energy into what they look like. So I'm agreeing with you, Adam. And I think to that it's going to be great to have you and Fabienne go different directions than Andrew and build out the possibilities as opposed to, and then how the text works in those environments, right? That's, that's what we're doing and not worry about the rest of that right now. So what, what's the interactive elements like they do not have to be the same in each environment and then decide later once we see once we do testing because we need to do some usability testing at the conference let people test to see which interactions make more sense to them and then we can start to standardize our own standards yeah but we will still need to have the elements be known across the different environments as being the same element so you at do... some point yeah yeah, no, no, well, I, I think relatively soon. So if you move something to the left in Andrew's view, and then you go to Adam's, it should move the same to the left. I think that's going to be a very, very important aspect of this. It may turn out not to work, but as a, a data transport and open standards thing, I, I think that's crucial. If it turns out to be absolute hell to implement, you know, we can revisit it. I, I do think it's pretty core, though. Can I, can I say something for everybody just to respond? I agree with you that, that the ultimate product should be that. I'm just wondering if what we're trying to determine right now is what's the best way in which we interact with these with text in these environments. That's that's the big question. And so if we have different different opportunities, Andrews, Adams, Fabian's, and test that at the hypertext conference, and somebody might say, this is actually easier, this is actually better. And then we find out that that's actually not hard to develop. Then we can implement that across. Yeah, but abs absolutely. We... absolutely. But in terms of the actual data, right? That that's that, that's really really important. So, and I don't know if we're over discussing it. So let me just ask Fabian, Andrew, and Adam. Do you guys feel that the coordinate data will be clear enough that you can share amongst each other, or do you think that'll be a major logistical issue to work out? Um, it's, it's, well, it depends, right? <laughs> it's, it's big asterisks. Um, for coordinates for me, since I'm working in like a, a cylinder, um, X is not actually position, it's rotation based off of the center of the world. Um, that shouldn't really matter that much because you can just interpret it differently. Um, but I do use that system. So like, y is up and down of course x is rotation um around the world and then z would be um viewing distance so you probably don't have to take z at all z could be something that all of our systems just do their own thing with um but that's how i'm working with the coordinate system yeah okay. yeah and i i wonder how how often we want to have kind of position data transferred between the system or used in both system um if uh, if we move something in uh, in the cylinder space, Andrew's cylinder, will that really translate to, let's say, a free form uh, all over the room or AR experience, which I try out? Probably not. So it's more about preserving that data. So if you open it in my system, it should really still keep all Andrew, Andrew's uh, coordinates uh, in the cylinder space. So, so nothing gets lost in translation. So it really saves for all the different interactions. So, so I think that is a main concern. And if we want to translate things, we can do that programmatically. Um, uh, that's 
that's doable, of course. But the most important thing is to preserve the data and not throw things away if you go back and forth between. Yeah, that, that's absolutely crucial. And, and this is so important. We Sorry about all the yellow hands. We'll just address this and then we'll go, go to hands. Um, yes, we need to be able, each environment needs to store its own data. Right. Yeah. I would say as a visual medic meta appendix that can be deleted or not or used or not. Um, but I, I really do think that uh, the notion of spatial hypertext means that the user may have certain logic for layouts. So when we go between environments, it should be preserved unless the user ha has expressed a reason for it not to be. Right. So I think as a basic thing, it's really, really important. But let's say Fabian does something completely off the charts. We should still be able to take the data in and out. But... Are you thinking, I'm trying to understand here. Um, are you thinking of kind of a, a 2D mind map that it will look the same if you move it from the cylinder or uh, to my wall, for example, the AR wall? Is that what you're thinking about? Or are you thinking about kind of three uh, full 3D positioning? I, I am thinking about both, but I am thinking, uh, and, and this is what we need to define. Uh, probably, uh, slap me in the face if I'm wrong, we will have an initial 2D layout with a with depth to it. And of course, in Android world, that becomes a cylinder then, but it still has the central point as the central point. It has depth going out in different things. This should be entirely warpable in Adam and Fabian world, of course. But the thing is, it takes time and effort to do these layouts. And one of the things we discussed, of course, is the user should be able to save layouts and save layout criteria. So there's nothing wrong with going from Android world to Adam world, and it com looks completely different if that is what the user has specified. But if the user is still doing the basic stuff, you know, having spent all this time doing this, that, and the other, putting on the headset, it shouldn't be a mess. That's all. Okay, lots of thoughts on that, and uh, we will go to the yellow hands. Uh, Samu, yeah, Samu, I will try. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, it has been great to listen to the discussions. I mean, I am not privy to all of the conversations that have happened thus far, but one thing I thought to chime in for a little bit is that uh, when you're talking about shortening the titles of papers, I, I want to bring out that bit for a bit. Uh, instead of shortening the titles for papers, maybe you can focus on getting certain words of the titles in bold or increasing the font of those uh, words and the others remain out of focus or, or, or smaller size in font so that the entirety of the title remains, but the reading part, that becomes easier. Uh, so uh, I, I don't know if that at, at all makes sense in the design environment that you are talking about, but you can still have uh, the space shortened up with the font size reduced of certain words, and certain words may be boldened up and the font size increased. So uh, just getting my thoughts out there. Yeah, thank you. Useful and important. Um, um, these are exactly the kind of things we need to experiment with. Uh, Mark. Um, I'll rattle through a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, it's perfectly possible that this, this idea of augmenting the HTML with something extra we could probably do for this year. I could have a look at that, probably one of these these current papers are out the way, um, ju just just by way of a, in a sense, a, a confected demo. For instance, I, 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 I'm quite quite interested with this idea of being able to find a part of the paper comprising maybe non-contiguous bits of text and images or tables that basically are a whole, and being able to show that these are these could be addressable objects. And obviously what you do with them, we won't know really, we need to be able to get hold of them before we realize whether it makes sense or not. We experiment with that. Um, I'm minded also that there's a, actually Dini's just stepped out, but I'm, I'm reminded there is gonna be a summer school, well, there should be, there's hope to be, uh, just before um, the Poznan conference. So that's the Saturday, Sunday before. So there's an opportunity possibly um, because we'll have a number of grad students there um, to do an experiment. 
I mean, if we're if we're ready for it and have all fours to sign off and things, we we actually could possibly run some literally hot experiments that we can we can report on in the main conference. Just an idea. It's not something we have to do. It's something we could do if we're ready for it. Um, in, in special habitat Scott mentioned. I, it's worth bearing in mind that there, there are two sort of conflicting. Well, not conflicting. There are two alternate sort of conceptions of it. One is where it's algorithmically laid out. And the other where um, it's manually laid out by a human. Um, the latter is the one where you probably definitely want to hold on to where something was. Even if you never use it again, you don't know you don't need that position uh, until you do need it and you can't find it. Um, whereas algorithmically, um, it will go back to ostensibly the last state or whatever state you saved in because the algorithm should put things back where they were before. Um, and Lastly, it occurred to me that the different things you may be doing in terms of the data you need to pass across is um, sort of sort versus position, I think. So, so part of it is putting things different from something else and allied to that is sort of sorting and set making. You maybe want to take something out of this group here and put it over there, or, you know, whether it's a copy or the, or the or the only piece on the board, as it were, at the moment, again, is is for exploration. Um, but those just seem two activities. I'll just quickly say, as Dini's back, just occurred to me the summer school is an opportunity to possibly do an experiment if we're that ready, because we'll, we, we could try um, some of the things we're talking about. We've got some additional test people to the extent that even when we get to present at the conference, we may be able to say, well, we actually tried it with 10 people. And here are some of the stuff we found. Uh, it entirely depends on whether we're ready or not, but um, just something to bear in mind that hadn't occurred to me until the other the other day. Thanks, Peter. That, that's a great idea. And let me mention to um, Shamu that we have a summer school that is uh, providing full support for people that want to, for graduate students that want to study hypertext over the summer and, and then at the conference in Poznan, in Poland. So uh, let me put that in your ear, let you know about it, okay? Mark, that's a great idea. And um, Peter. Okay. Um, I like to get as abstract as possible, so I don't like the idea necessarily of paying exact coordinates. Uh, we might be in different size spaces. I might be interested in having something in a two meter cube. Uh, someone else might be in a fully immersive mode. So the exact coordinates might not be as relevant as the relative relationship between elements. Um, also in a given visualization, I might want to be mapping the coordinates as I'm moving something around to an attribute that's stored in visual meta. So that it wouldn't be X that I'm moving around so much. It might be that by dragging this object close to a Mark centroid, I'm indicating what degree I think it belongs to that set. And I might want to have a set membership level be bumped up in the visual meta for the document and not care where it is X, Y in the space that I'm working. I might be constantly changing what the dimensions, the points are arranged in mean. And I wanna be working in terms of binding functions, associating attributes to where they're positioned spatially. Yeah, that's really important. So to paraphrase you, to see if we're on the same wavelength, um, relationships of different types matter. Um, so Fabian, uh, you wrote here, didn't get my turn, sorry. I wanted to say that I share the CSL JSON with additional metadata starting with position a few weeks ago. Is that something you've had a chance to look at, Andrew? Uh, I did glance at it. I haven't like gone through in depth. Um, so I saw that it was there. Um, uh, my system doesn't use CSL JSON, so I currently can't do anything with it. But um, if uh, we want to try to adapt those two, I can try to make changes. Um, I'm not against making changes. I'm just saying where it's currently at, mine just uses JSON because that's what 3JS exports. So I just I use that export and then do some fiddling on top. Um, most likely, I'll redesign a save load system once we get to the uh, map view. Um, to make it because it doesn't need as much information. So I'll I'll probably that's what's going to get stuck into the library view. So that's 
Or at least that's what we called it at the time. This, we have a lot of changing terminology recently, so I'm getting caught up on, on what means what at this point. Yeah, no, well, this is crucial. <laughs> this, again, it makes me very happy to have this discussion. So, um, Andrew, could you please explain to us what you are currently using for position data in a sense, in the kind of a sense that you're talking to Adam and Fabian and ignore, ignore people like me? Okay, so what I'm currently using doesn't really matter, though, because it's for saving and loading the workspace, which nobody else is doing. That's not what's important. Um, the We're talking about all sharing, saving and loading the uh, map view, correct? Or am I completely on a different page from everybody else? The, the page you should be on is, um, uh, hang on a second here. Uh, just to make sure we, we really are on the same page. Uh, you can see the screen, right? So, yeah. So what I have here is a list of all last year's papers. I go to the map view, and here it is. And it's uh, all a bit of a mess. So I can do things like this that most of you have seen. I'm now choosing categories of things like only document, hide them, bring them back. And then I can do layout things. So when you're talking about a workspace, I would say that that relates to this, um, you know, where these things are. Uh, it also might relate to other things as an external uh, elements, looking at what these things are. Uh, ideally, um, oh, okay. Yeah, Leon, look forward to seeing you on Monday and see how you want to work with this as well. So uh, ideally, okay, we're calling this currently high resolution thinking, right? And that's partly because you're working natively with a full field of view. So these different approaches that you guys are doing will provide, as Dini highlighted, it is so important that they are different interactions. So we don't wanna build metadata behind that that'll slow any of you down, right? But it, there should be enough transferable metadata about not just the static stuff inside this, but also the Fabian active stuff inside these things. Uh, the, and it should all, to some degree, be compressible to the 2D space. Um, I was thinking Fabian, but Adam, do you have a quick point on this? Or, or are you just holding something? You're muted. Let Fabian take that. <laughs> He's been run over, over. Uh, regarding the positioning um, and the format, uh, I, I think I said before, but I'm I'm, on, I'm not advocating that specific format. It's like the one I implemented, so it's easier for me. We we can have like filters that convert from one format to another. I think overall, none of them um, don't seem like crazy one way or another. So as long as um, as long as there is some kind of use case, that's what pulls, let's say, the data we need to use. Uh, and then we focus on converting from one format to another, whatever format that is, relatively easily. And also it makes it, makes it easy to test. So I, I don't, honestly, that doesn't strike me as a hard problem to solve. Sure, if, if like there is a cylinder space and another one is orthogonal, um, uh, yeah, orthogonal, let's say, uh, it's, there is some conversion to do, but it's pretty normal to do. It's the same way you go from a flat map to a spheric map. It's it's things that must be done anyway, so that I'm not too worried about this. Uh, we just need to find like what what actually do we want to do after switching from one environment to the next. This way, we it pulls, let's say, what uh, what we need. Uh, one quick thing, so I have to leave also at thirty, uh, and I'll I refresh. So I hope that you can let me know if you can see my screen, please. Yes. Yep. Ah, super. So that's the trick for me. Just restart refreshing. Um, so it's uh, it's the same as before, except like following uh, Dini's comment, I couldn't help but think indeed uh, I need to adjust the layout. And what if your usage is not my usage because your dexterity is not my dexterity. So what I do, you can see, I hope that um, that I'm in the environment changing the layout. So the buttons from that menu, change the color still. Now I can show them even when I don't use them and then I change. And when I go back and forth, they 
preserve their position. Voilà. And I, I wanted to show this because uh, to me, I know it sounds maybe a little bit uh, inappropriate when I put the headset while I'm chatting with you all. But what I get from those meetings uh, is such ideas that I didn't consider before, which is like the most valuable thing for me. Uh, and then I just can't wait. I want to try it and be able to go from the idea, um, the demo to the new idea that you uh, provided, not me. And then I can try it and say, ah, it actually works and makes sense. And then show you again, to me, it's uh, extremely precious. So I wanted to say thank you for this. Uh, that's really nice to hear, Fabian. We're going to finish in six minutes. Um, Emily also has some problems getting to Edgar to pick him up from school today. So it's all fortuitous that most of us have to finish soon. But so this is what I would like. And tell me if it is reasonable or not. By next Wednesday, OK, because we're running short on time to better understand what to put on our paper. I really want Adam, Fabian and Andrew to have managed to have maybe even a half an hour meeting to do the basic sharing stuff. Because Fabian, with all the love and respect, you know, you're gonna get a big hug when you come here. I really get scared when new technical brilliant people say it's really easy and I'm not worried. Because to me that says, I'm not gonna do it now, <laughs> right? So I, I really would like you to take what Andrew has as a JSON, if Andrew could reshare that, have a look at it and either say, you will copy that style or tell Andrew to share something. Is that fair? Because just like we were stressing months ago, getting something in XR, now I'm a little bit stressing about being able to share. I don't want to get into the summer and be like, Ugh. yeah, sure. It's uh, send me the the JSON file, uh, and I'll I'll display it, and I'll display it. Uh, how do you say? Even incorrectly, it doesn't matter. At least there will be like uh, names floating in space in the wrong position. And then if I get stuck, I ask Andrew, <laughs> I'm sorry, but this, uh, yeah, I'll regret it. Uh, but uh, I'm not worried for this. So let's say if I, okay, in order to um, not sound too uh, arrogant, uh, if I get by the end of the working day today such a JSON file, then uh, for Monday next week or Wednesday worst, uh, I'll get something from someone else's environment like Andrew to mine. Well, that's wonderful, Fabian. You get to choose the first dinner we're having when we're together in London. Um, Adam, how about you? Are you okay also getting this nitty gritty at this point? Yeah, yeah, but I am still a bit reluctant to kind of sh the X y sharing coordinate between different views doesn't make so much sense to me. Um, other things like sharing a note, a comment on a paper or something that would make sense to have in different views that you could pop up in different ways in different views. But if I think taking one workspace and and trying to force that into another way of viewing it, it, it feels like, um, yeah, I, I don't really see it, 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 I can understand it for smaller pieces, perhaps a small map, but uh, for the whole interaction doesn't make sense to try uh, because it's uh, kind of the space we're transforming. So taking one coordinate or a rotation from one system to another doesn't make much sense. It can be done, but then I'm replicating the things the other person just did. Okay, I, I see Fabian's got his hand up, but the thing is, th that's a really good addition, by the way, a note or an annotation, we need to take that into account as well. It's kind of a floating element that needs to be connected in a way, but the, the use case we have here is someone going through the proceedings of one conference, right? So these, the, the, this is a specific goal, and that's for someone to understand what all these different documents are, see what's relevant to them, hide the ones that are not, and then is Siri, I'm not talking to you. And then in trying to have access to you know various views. So it's not going to be the world's largest data set by default. Of course, it can be bigger over time. But that is why I really think you're doing a thing here. You want to do it here. I expect you, Adam, to go absolutely crazy. But I would really like it if you could try to have the most basic um, replication as an initial thing. Uh, before you answer, Fabian, quick. Super quick, uh, I put, it's called gdal.org uh, in the chat is what I used in GIS um, project before. It's for real world coordinates, but I think in terms of 
going from one set of coordinates to another, um, I think it's a worthwhile exercise because indeed if we want to interface with others that have such solution, we don't care. So I'm, I'm not saying it's going to be uh, easy or useful or whatnot, but I think in principle, it, it's not the only place where it's useful. So it, it's I think to try at least is valuable. Yeah, good. Uh, Danny has to go. Some of you have to go. Thank you, Danny. Um, I, I think today was, yeah, Danny, go, please. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, Shamu, for coming today. Good to see you. And thank you, everybody. And uh, I will have the draft of the demo done this week. Okay. Before you Bye. go, Danny, two left, two words, view spec. Mark Anderson calls it view spec. That is really how we should think about this. Bye. Uh, I mean, I think, think about what? The the paper or what? No, no, the, the different people, the, uh, Andrew, Adam, Fabian Worlds, in a sense, are... Forget the fact that it's different code. They're different views of the same data. Hence okay, okay. That's that all. makes sense. Okay, good. Thank you. Just kind of threw it out there, and I just I didn't see the uh, the remark. Okay, bye everybody. Bye bye. Um, yeah. Um, see you later, those of you who have to leave. Um, Andrew, Adam, Fabian, this is the time for you guys to really make sure you're you're happy with everything. I guess the main thing is Fabian, you're going to wait on the JSON for me to see if you can do anything with it. Um, Adam has an interesting point of perhaps we all save our own positional data independently. We all give them like different uh, variable names in the information. So if we want to interpret one another's positional data, we can, but it's not necessary. I don't know. That's an option. Um, Fabian, my current JSON sort of test export I made for the library um, back when it was called the library doesn't have the positional data. It just has like room for it. Um, so I can get that to you like right away. Or, or if you want me to actually get a version that has positional data that I currently use, um, I can try to get that today, but most likely that would be tomorrow. So just to clarify, I'm not in actual rush, so don't stress over this. Uh, I think it's better to delay a, a little bit to have actual position. Uh, and, and because otherwise, I don't know if my conversion, if I need to convert anything, is correct. So I think it's better to have the JSON or whatever format you want with positional data. Uh, and I'm also, I mean, we're all working in 3GS, so theoretically, in terms of position, as long as you use world coordinates, should be easy. Yeah, if we're just using world coordinates, that's fine. And I could adjust the way I save it because, um, like I said, I haven't currently built a save system for the sort of map view. Um, I'm saving the workspace information, which isn't something that carries over from what I understand. Um, so having the the map save it's kind of a bit theoretical right now what we actually want um i assume we want like every tag to be saved different positioning and whatnot which now that i think about it the tags are set up as an array right now so if we want information on that that's actually not going to work okay we may have to do some changes with the layout i could have run but uh i trust you uh, just briefly before we let uh, Fabian run away, I put no. this little stupid quote, man is the measure of all things. All I mean by that is we are working in a human space. We're working in a room. We don't have to worry about having a galaxy of information for this bit right now. Bye-bye, Fabian. Um, so, uh, Adam, uh, the, the Peter thing of um, the importance of having metadata and deleting it, uh, is that kind of what you were saying? We all have our different coordinate systems or, or all different metadata and the different, the other dis systems can choose whether to interpret that or not. Is that the approach you were thinking about? Yeah, th that's w one part of it. Uh, it's more that I struggle to see the exact use case from a kind of an interaction point where you would be in one workspace and then use all those coordinates in a totally different workspace. I can uh, I, I totally see it from going from a laptop into a VR space, for example, taking having a 2D 
two different uh, 2D and uh, 2D in, in VR XR. Uh, that conversion is but going from different kind of 3D environments uh, doesn't make so much so much sense to me right now as a use case. What would you actually do with the uh, with the, um, if you lay something out in the, in this on the cylinder or uh, like a perfect space for you there? What okay. kind of information would you like to have in a completely different kind of 3D? <laughs> yeah, that's a very clever question. And just briefly before I hand over to Mark, um, you're absolutely right. I would like to be able to go from a flat screen into XR, do stuff and go back and lose nothing, even if the XR, you know, I want it to be able to be printed on paper, have visual meta at the back. And if it's scanned OCR again, you can still go to XR. That's a prime dream for me. Um, however, the intelligence inside the nodes and all of these things um, needs to be captured externally as well in the metadata. Um, so there's absolutely nothing wrong with, for instance, having only 2D XR and back and forth the simplest and then having additional stuff for different additional environments. If you want to have a build an environment that's got nothing to do with that, that's basically a sculpture. Uh, fine. You know, that should be storable in a different way. It doesn't have to fit on a flat page necessarily. So I'm not completely disagreeing with you. I just think the notion of view specs, the notion of trying to have things reflected in different ways is useful, but it shouldn't constrain us. Mark, please. I'm just going to sort of reiterate my point about the view specs was really, I, I, that's what I heard when I heard Adam speak earlier, in the sense that if I draw something, if I take the same data and I draw it as a tree map based on some arbitrary attribute of like maybe the number of words in that in that object, um, will give me a different set of metadata to if I laid it out as a spatial hypertext or if I laid it out as some other things. So sort of size and position, may be very much tied to what you're actually doing. So I think I think there's an unintentional confusion creeping in here between me taking something I've laid out in my room, as it were, and putting the same information maybe in a basically in a similar view spec of somebody else, as opposed to me going, taking the same data and just deciding that instead of seeing it in this form, I would see it in that form, in which case much of that much of the positional metadata will have no longer have meaning simply because I'm no longer using that positional data in a meaningful way, oh, or I'm using a different set of positional data. Um, so there are sort of, it's almost like there are two intersecting things that need to be captured. So some of it's to do with um, just it, when I initialize this space, where the heck do I put it? And there's other things that will be more tightly bound to what you are doing in that environment, if I can call it that. It's, so in other words, so for instance, when I go into the space that Andrew's created for us, for instance, in the demos, that's like a space. If I then take that information and put it into something, say, that Fabienne has built, there may be a limited amount of the information, and Adam, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a limited amount of the information that I've taken from the first place that has use in the second space, though we still want to hold on to it, because we might, if for no other reason, then we might then want to take it back from the second space into the first space. I mean, am I understood correctly? Yeah, and uh, we have. Uh, I've been uh, been there many times in in programming when you have when you have two systems and you and a different view. Let's say you are in three D and add a new thing. Uh, where will that land in two D when you go back? And the other way around, if you if you add a, if you have your flat map and add a thing in two D next to something that is in 3D space. So it's not, um, it's easy to gloss over these things, but uh, very little to information actually transfers well, and uh, you need to kind of hand do most of it. Um, or do, do uh, yeah, do, uh, that's one thing. Uh, but there are many things that, that do transfer, and I think kind of making coll collections, lists, um, and li uh, like annotations, they can transfer very, very well because the most important part there is not kind of the ex exquisite layout you have created in one space, but uh, the information in itself. And it could be uh, just as well. Uh, you, like with a note on your phone, you could have a very different uh, layout on your phone and it still works fine for most notes. Not all of them, but most notes can be... Uh, 
in, look very different, but to position data is not one of those things. It's very tied to the space. It strikes me also that the positional data matters more if you're dealing with things like if you've got essentially an environment that's like a memory palace, it really matters that something's on that side rather than this side. Otherwise, it may generally be the case that what you need to know is you need to know the spatial relationship of the object. So, so in other words, you may you may scratch them on a bigger screen or something. So the key thing is that relative to one another, um, things are in the right place. So in a sense, so right is a flexible term. Whereas obviously, if I took something that that had a very precise meaning in terms of, you know, we were projecting it onto a room. Well, it's no good if some of the things are underneath the floor of the room, because clearly then then the the artifice of the room doesn't work. But but that's why that's how I can see this as sort of difference in the in the in the, the stuff we 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 capture. So this is the kind of discussion that is just, I, I know I've said it before, it, it's so important, I'm so grateful. Um, because just like with Fabienne's little pinching thing and it's sticking to your finger kind of, you know, there's gonna be so many unknowns here. Um, the, the, the basic dream is kind of Harry Potter-ish slash uh, minority report, right? You should be able to work in almost any media and then go into craziness. Not everything you can take back with you, of course not. But everything should be retained. So if you go back to that crazy environment, you will have that data. That, so that we all agree on that. So they're, they're kind of different things to go in. Um, we also really need to think about Adam's notion of annotations in this environment, because an annotation may be just a thing on a thing, that's simple. But it may be important where on a thing it is, top left, bottom right, maybe it means something for the user. It may be floating between two things. So when it comes to this, I just think we should build, test, build, test, build, test. How exciting is this, guys? Literally building an entirely new way of looking at the world. Of course, Andrew, you have to do a lot of the coding, so you may not share the excitement, but the outcome would be amazing. Um, yeah, I mean, e even just working on the map in author has turned out to be a real pain because incrementally, oh, no, this is not good. This is not good. So learning that stuff and trying to trying to get my programmers to do that right now is a hassle. Um, oh, hang on a second. So with apologies to Mark, I have a book. Oh, right. Alberto Caro. Is that is a new one? Yes, I thought it was a. Oh. I thought I pre-ordered it, but I did actually order it. It turns out, um, it, it's good. I highly recommend you all get it. I just glanced through it. We invited him to um, be part of our work, so he hasn't replied yet. You know, but the point is there are so many ways of looking at this. So Adam, thank you for not um, letting us look at this in a simple way, because I know you're going to do some crazy stuff. But you, you're selling me as a crazy, the crazy person. <laughs> I just think that we we actually in this community we we've been doing more things than we remember for the last few years, and we investigated. Uh, I think we have forgotten that many of the learnings we could have. Uh, so we really should dig them up. Uh, sometimes it feels like we are starting over and we learn many things. And we're, uh, but that's the nature of it. And it's a new group. Um, I really want us to um, to remember <laughs> what we learned along the way. We tested with lots of 3D stuff early on or XR stuff or VR stuff and in inventories and um, we tried we tried games and discussed that and uh, some of it we lost along the way and it's good to kind of quickly get that back into a place um, because I hear the echoes of that right um, in the, yeah. on the future text lab website we do have links to at least what we did two years ago so most of it works which is good uh, I completely agree it's crucial we keep it the way that Andrew is working now of course every bit of code stays frozen for that version and it's on on our record so I think that is absolutely important I'm also very grateful now that we're working to have a bundle of data and environments to work with it in because at the end of this I remember Doug was very disappointed after the 68 demo 
he expected people to come and say, this is great. I'm going to compete with you. Let's have fun. Let's make it better. And basically nothing happened. So I'm not that we're Doug Engelbart or anything like that, but I do think that with the start of the hypertext conference, put people in this, look at real stuff that they care about, and then understand that this is data that's shared in different environments already. You know, that's that's powerful. Peter, I see your hand. Yeah, I just wanted to say that it's been a really great discussion today. Um, I love that we're not getting too locked into the specific coordinates in one given implementation. It's important to keep that high level in mind and really lean hard on visual meta and what we can do with it and extend that beyond it just being a copy of a bibliography of just bib text listings like it originally started as. I see it really growing and starting to mature. We can start thinking about adding new modules for new kinds of information that we can layer on, a module for AI summarization, a module for entity and reference extraction, a module for those fuzzy resource leads that we get that we currently don't have recorded formally anywhere that can make such a huge difference. And uh, that's sort of that little piece that I'll be mailing you later today once I get a chance to give it a good close proofreading. But unfortunately for now, I need to drop and log into a webinar starting at the top of the hour. Thank so, you. Peter. See you on Monday. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see your hand there, Mark. I, I just want to obviously thank Peter for talking about visual meta and remind you guys, all visual meta is, is here's data, easy to find out, easy to delete if you want to. I think that's important. Mark. I was very really noting sort of more for the ongoing record, just the fact that I, I think it, I think a, a pertinent thing to to us doing this here is that, funnily enough, the hypertext community, and I mean that in the most expansive sense, not not necessarily the academic hypertext community only, um, is a, is rather well placed to look at this because it's less grounded in sort of fixity. So for a long time, it's it's been quite happy to uh, to to grapple with things like uh, multifaceted narrative and nonlinear narrative. So this idea that thing has to have a form, I think is less alien in the hypertext community than it is in many other places. Uh, and the other useful thing is it's had a long lineage of, of both the, the purely creative and in a sense the pure engineering sides sitting quite closely together. Because there's always a certain certain degree of yin and yang. You, know, you can't build a bridge on hope. It actually has to stand up. By, by the same token, um, if you have too much structure, it, it crushes the creativity. So I, I think it's it's really useful um, to be doing this in the context of something like the high test com uh, um, conference and, and 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 through that the wider community. Because I think I think they're better placed to understand um, the broad issues. Um, rather than what can otherwise happen is people will will latch on to um, much more minor things, all of which need doing. So there there will be big engineering problems in the corners that will be a you know those in themselves will be a big job for somebody to sort out. But this stage, trying trying to see the broad strands, and what works and what might work, I think is is well placed in hypertext. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Andrew, you'll put the JSON again on Slack so that Peter will see it, right? If, if you put yeah, I, I thought we had agreed that I was going to make some adjustments to it that would include the coordinate yeah, system. Yeah, yeah. But sure, in, okay. no rush, just but whatever. Just I just wanted to highlight, you know. Um, now, oh, oh, by the way, a very British thing, uh, Mark, uh, on the way that I walk Edgar to school in the morning, there was a lot of overhanging branches, kind of dangerous. People are kind of up to go on the road. So I complained to the council last week. They actually have a, a web-based system for taking those kinds of issues. And today, Emily just texted a picture, the branches have been cut. That doesn't happen very often. That deserves to be on the, the record. But anyway, um, in closing, from my side anyway, um, I am so grateful for the very, very different perspectives in this group because we are dealing with something entirely new and not new. And I think each one of us sees new and not new quite differently. Um, and that is really, really, really important. The one legacy that I want to have from this work is to be able to inspire other people to think about information interaction in different ways. I think we're really working on that. And um, 
uh, Mark and Andrew, just to clarify. So Adam is kind of our official outsider, insider for the first six months, Fabian for the next six months. Uh, but in terms of specific timing, doesn't matter. But they are th the key doing other stuff that comes into it. So it's not just a general discussion here. It's more formal in a way. Um, Adam, do you want to say anything else on that topic? Um, well, mostly that I, I will start with the kind of what, what Mark and I have been doing, kind of the the visualizations of hypertext. But I'm very interested in. I feel that to, I want to uh, and would be fun or in very interesting to do more of XR things. Right now we're doing, yeah, two D trans, um, yeah, mostly two D stuff in three D. Um, would be interesting to fully take uh, take the hands on gestures, voice, and perhaps a bit more immersive three dimensional things as well. Uh, just so we uh, we really use the medium. Um, we know, already know what the critique will be, in that way, I can do that on my screen. I want to have a few things that can't be done on screen, <laughs> or easily done on screen, just to uh, push the boundaries a bit. But we could also push the boundaries in just doing good interfaces that have uh, that haven't been done so far in two D two D, even though they should have been, or with metadata, or with interaction, or with writing, or with reading. There are so many, even low hanging fruits that are not picked in a kind of ebook readers and uh, everything. So we we have lots of opportunities wherever we start now, because. Um, things are not that well implemented or well uh, good in uh, in the text space, at least. I'm so glad to have that as towards our kind of closing comments today, because um, I, I think we're on so much on the same page. We need to do something that is obvious, but has to be done. And Andrew, that is primarily you. You're very good at making these things work. And you are our safety catch. Because what you're building, you know, it is 2D in a, in a cylinder in one level, obvious, but then we see how bloody complicated it is to do well. And then Adam does some crazy stuff that most of it we expect not to make any sense. But that doesn't matter. This is going in our future textbook. It's going in the Sloan thing. It's going in hypertext thing. So, yeah, we, we're combining sensible with completely what in the world is just wonderful. Yeah, uh, but we shouldn't typecast ourselves too hard. I think. No, no. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, so uh, I will do bore. Uh, I will do boring, ordinary things, useful things, uh, and uh, I'm sure. And I've already seen Andrew do kind of good interactions that only make sense in XR, and uh, that's kind of new, uh, breaking new ground. So explore new alternatives and new. Uh, so um, it's important to not be too hardly typecast, but to. Uh, I just wanted to show you something briefly on that point. Uh, obviously, I very much agree with you. So here is some um, thesis. Oh, what's going on there? Of course, now that I'm on here with you guys, I'm having crashes. But um, let's see if we can open this. There we go. So you know, I'm an artist by training and by birth, basically. Uh, don't worry, it's my computer being slow, not your view. So I like to do the way out stuff, but this is what I've been working on most of the time recently. It's this con context menu. Because I, I think it is so insanely important to have a context menu that is useful. Because once you have a long context menu, you know, in author, the context menu is awful. I mean, look at that. You know, I'm, I'm trying to make it smaller. People will not read that. But in here, so, you know, basic testing, like um, we're here, we have the Ask AI stuff. And it's really nice to have the edit button here so you can instantly change what the commands are. Um, and here we have annotation now, many colors. And the key thing is you can just do R to get it red. That doesn't work yet. But I just want to show you the last ones. Obviously, we have text. Uh, quote, copy as text, but also copy as a quote, meaning it has visual meta attached. Those should be options with keyboard shortcuts. Lyft does this. It puts it in a differently readable way. Uh, but then this is the last thing that I've been working on. 
we have find and document, find in library, but find online is um, actually the enter key now. So when you're talking about not putting ourselves in, in the box, uh, I agree with you. I, I just think that uh, you coming on board in this particular capacity, Adam, working on this, we have more freedom, that's all. Right, um, Andrew, any comments, questions or poetry? No, I, I think I'm I'm good. Yeah, good, good. Um, all right, so...